everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another EBFA webinar. This one is going to be kind of the evolution of how we are looking at sensory perception at EBFA Global and of course through Naboso technology. Um, this is really bringing the power of sensory stimulation from just the literal perspective of your bare feet, being on a textured mat, feeling the external environment, and seeing how we can connect that to a more internal awareness of our clients and then of course bridging them and then the application that we're using that for here in today's lecture is going to be in fall reduction and why I wanted to do a webinar on this is I do a lot of webinars through various functional aging um, platforms different government agencies that have to do with um, uh, reducing falls and keeping uh, individuals active with aging. Um, some fun statistics when it comes to baby boomers is that every single day, every single day, 10,000 adults in the US turn over age 65. Um, so that gives you a perspective of how large this um, area is becoming as far as um, you know, the opportunity and the potential and how we address that. So when I speak to these different platforms, they often ask me and say, hey, Dr. Spickle, um, where do you start? If you're trying to reduce falls in someone, where do you start? Where's your, your kind of go to when they can be quite complex? Let's say they have comorbidities, they have hearing loss, they have, you know, disruptions in vision, maybe they have dementia. Maybe they also have neuropathy, they're overweight. So you're kind of thinking of this very complex client, which is, you know, unfortunately a large numbers of the individuals as they start to get older. And I say that I start, my step one is helping them feel their body. So if you're trying to reduce falls in someone who has everything that I just described, and you are focusing just on kind of literal balance, right? Just how can they maintain um, a single leg stance or a weight shift? Or um, let me focus on um, you know, muscle strength, like tricep strength is something, grip strength. Those are all indicators in really longevity. But even before that, I think that we need to focus on really their aware, awareness of themselves, that if they don't have a perception of where they are, where their body is, where kind of in a mind-body connection perspective, then perhaps everything else that we try to do with them will not be as effective. So that's going to be our deep dive that we are taking. Um, for anyone who is new to me, my background, EBFA, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Splickle. I'm a podiatrist, um, but it's so much more than that. A human movement specialist, founder of EBFA Global. So I write a lot of our education, um, have authored several books, and I'm actually writing another one which is called Sensory Sapiens. So that is due to come out the end of this year. And that's really taking this topic much, much broader and a deep dive, um, but it's really the application of sensory stimulation for longevity. And then of course, I'm the founder of Novoso. So please follow me and the various companies on social media, and we will get you started through some Novoso. Um, just real quick mentioning that that is a sponsor. So stay tuned all the way at the end. I'm going to give you a special offer. Here we go. The reality of false. So when you are looking at the problem that this is, this is a major problem. And if falls are the number one concern with the aging population and the population is getting older, obviously the concern of falls or the reality of falls is just going to scale to the same degree. Now, if we look at just in the United States, uh, back in 20. Uh, I believe it was 2018 is this data. It was a $50 million. So every year, $50 million is spent on health-related costs. Now, if you bring in globally, how big is this issue? Because I know there's a lot of listeners from other countries that by the year 2040, based off of projections of the aging population, they're looking to see that globally falls and fall-related costs and healthcare costs is going to hit around 240 billion. That is obviously a major concern and problem. 
And if you want to take it away from just this monetary is think of the effect on quality of life for these individuals. Now, in the space of active aging, baby boomers, fall reduction, there's really this, this whole mass of people that are creating technology and systems to detect falls. But if you detect a fall, what have you done to prevent a fall? So at EBFA and of course at Noboso, we're much more on the side of we need to look at how we're preventing falls because if you can detect a fall but you can't stop that fall, then right, what did you do for that individual? Um, is it great for data collection? Sure, but what did it do to immediately change that individual's life? And that's where I like to look from the prevention side, Nabosa's role, barefoot science role, sensory science role, and how all of us can help these individuals make a powerful impact. Where do we start, right? Is it the strength? Is it the awareness? Is it internal awareness? Is it external awareness? Is it central or is it peripheral? Is it a peripheral neuropathy or do they have MS and Parkinson's? So did they have a stroke, right? We want to always factor in. And these are the questions that I, I think that you should be asking yourself is where do I start and in what aspect should I be addressing this? So we're going to be taking this from a perception perspective, both a internal and external perception to help that client and individual identify with themselves, with I am. And this is very important with the aging population because let's say you're dealing with someone who's a little less active. Maybe they don't work out as often. Maybe they have lost a loved one or they're dealing with the complexity of their medical diagnosis. That starts to create different emotions in the body that may start to cause a disassociation from the self. Um, oftentimes you will see that people associate more of a depressive mood with a dissociative body perception, right? Um, depress is to essentially kind of uh, separate from. Um, so you can see a higher association of loss of sense of self in those that are more depressive. And depression rates in those 65 plus is obviously increasing because of a myriad of reasons. But we want to help them to connect to I am and a big part of this is I am, am I? And the continued question of that that we go through, even though we might not realize it, is am I safe, right? Is my, my survival safe? Is my awareness of where I am both internally and externally safe? So this foundation of survival is foundational to all of our interactions, interactions with ourselves and then interactions with the environment and interactions with others. That's continuously what's happening. We may realize that or not. Um, anyone who has ever dealt with any trauma or accidents in any way, you have felt what it feels like to have your nervous system shifted from a safety perspective. Um, let's take for an example that you were you're driving your car and almost you know, rear-ended someone and then you realize like, Whoa, okay, you were safe, right? Or you avoided something like that and you stop the car and you're shaking right? That's a innate response within your nervous system of survival. There was a threat and then you, you obviously have this interpretation of that threat and your, your nervous system gets activated. Imagine if that was happening all day, every day, just for the simple act of walking, walking across the room because maybe you had a history of falls and you couldn't get up from your fall. So your your threat perception went higher and all of your, your nervous system is essentially on high alert, okay? That's what is happening with a lot of these clients who are within this aging client demographic that we're trying to reduce falls. That is built off of sensory perspective perception. So survival and sensory perception is an interpretation of both our internal and external environments. The purpose of that perception and the interpretation of survival is for modifying our movement, our memory, and our mood to ensure safety. That's ultimately what your nervous system wants to do is to survive and be safe. Um, that's where you could think of, let's take it to movement, for example, is 
if when, when we walk. So when we walk, optimally your body is moving very efficient efficiently. So part of the evolution of bipedalism was these mechanisms in place for us to move efficiently and to go further on less energy that's built into the elastic recoil of your connective tissue and why you absorb vibration from the ground as potential energy and you release it as elastic energy. That efficient energy process during bipedalism is built off survival. It's built off of you might not have a lot of energy, so we have to be really smart about our energy utilization. So let's actually move without even requiring any work output, let's move elastically like little rubber bands in like the pendulum theory or the spring theory when you run because you can go further longer and if I can't find food, I know I will still survive, okay? So that's how I want you to think of how important this is and how it relates to literally everything. Now, the sensory that we're looking at from external environments and internal environments is going to be called exteroception and interoception. Exteroception is our sensory perception of the external environment, and it utilizes exteroceptors. Okay? Interoception is going to be our sensory perception of our internal environment and utilizes interoceptors. Okay? So that's what we're going to take that deep dive through. They relate to themselves, obviously, and then they come together and they interrelate with each other. Let's start with exteroception because oftentimes this is the most well understood. This is the easiest to integrate and implement. So exteroception and exteroceptors. Two of the most common types of exteroceptors are going to be proprioceptors and mechanoceptors or proprioception and mechanoception. Proprioceptors and proprioception, this is the one that is most commonly understood of these two. This is where we're looking at stretch reflexes. So when you're about to sprain your ankle and you get a perineal stretch reflex, that is a proprioceptive response by the muscle spindles, the GTOs, it's stretch reflexes. Um, this is also where you can have proprioceptors sitting around joints and within the joint capsule. And then that gives a position of the joint as it's moving. Right, so I can tell that my arm is in a, so you can see, right, my arm, my hand is in a certain angle at the wrist joint, and I can sense that based off of these proprioceptors. Um, that we will see is referred to as joint position sense. That is hugely important when it comes to controlling dynamic movement, and of course, changes that happen and our ability to control dynamic movement with age. So joint position sense. I will tell you how to test that in a moment. And then this is going to be different than mechanoception, where mechanoceptors are essentially nerve endings that are sensitive to mechanical deformation is literally what it means. And there's going to be different types of mechanoceptors that we go over. So let's start with the proprioception. I already had mentioned joint position, but what I want you to add under that, if you're taking notes, is going to be joint position sense. That is what it is. And joint position sense, the way that you can um, appreciate this or test it in your clients is if their eyes are shut so they don't see from a mirror how you're moving them. And let's say with the arm, they're relaxed, you move the arm to, you know, this is approximately 45 degrees out from my body. And then you say, okay, move your arm here. And then you mark it somehow. And then you put the arm back and say, I want you to move your arm to the exact same position that I just had it. So this joint position sense, how well can they reproduce the angle that you put their arm in? If my arm right now is in a, is a 90 degree from the floor, do I feel that or is it higher? Right. Uh, for anyone who's taught group exercise ever or works with um, uh, kind of like larger group settings could be various ages and you're having them move their body in a certain way. And if you're having them do a lateral raise, right, so you just cue them to an exercise and you might have someone in the class that is just not mirroring you well, that they're moving their arms in a front raise versus a lateral raise or something like that, right? That's actually them uh, having a decreased body awareness. Doesn't mean that anything is wrong, but they have a decreased perception of self in the awareness in space that relates to a joint. 
joint position sense. We lose that with age, okay? Now, that's a little bit different than kinesthetic awareness or kinesthesia. Kinesthesia is um, an example of kinesthetic awareness that's very important for dynamic movement is let's say that you are riding a bike and you are trying to navigate the bike between two cars. You have to have an awareness of yourself and the bike and kind of spatial uh, relationships to see if you could fit between the two cars on your bike, or are you going to clip the side of the, the car? That's also a very important body awareness that is sensory perception based that is necessary for controlling dynamic movement. So kinesthetic awareness, kinesthesia, you're moving, right? As you're moving, how are you navigating your body in space? Of course, there's going to be sense of force, which is tension-based muscle tendon junctions, um, the muscle spindles, GTOs, things like that, that have to do with the um, force element. And then of course there is the velocity or the, the change in direction. Um, so your ability to perceive this, all of this has to do with movement as it relates to your ability to navigate your body externally, okay? Now there's another uh, layer to proprioception that I want to add here, which is going to be gravity. So gravity is a way to build or help build proprioceptive awareness of an individual's body in space. I use um, different tricks to enhance the awareness of gravity for my patients that have various movement disorders. So if you had a stroke, you have Parkinson's, MS, dystonia, any of these spinal cord injuries, whatever it is, you can essentially hack their proprioceptive system by using tools to increase the sense of self externally. How can you increase gravity, right? We're gonna go into that. And then of course you can use things like kinesiology taping, which we'll go into to enhance the sense of proprioception. Okay, now let's take a, a look at the other side. So when we look at the other side, mechanoceptors, mechanoception is going to be really looking at the glabrous skin and the hands and feet. For anyone who is quite familiar with EBFA's education and barefoot science and Naboso, um, this will be a review for you. And if you keep hearing this review, I do apologize, but it is foundational to everything that I speak about. Now mechanoception, so, um, I just want to briefly mention that a lot of people will interchange these and mis misuse where the word proprioception should actually go. Um, if you're doing wobble board training or you're standing on a BOSU or you are on a Dyna disc, those are proprioceptive training exercises. You are training essentially the stretch reflex. You are training joint position sense. So that makes sense to do that. Now, when you use the term um, uh, barefoot, so when you're barefoot and you're getting stimulation, because that's the nerves on the bottom of the feet, technically when you use naboso, that is a mechanoception modality versus proprioception. Um, so if you ever hear any of my team members say proprioception, shame on them, just kidding. Um, so mechanoceptors, here we go. So there's four main mechanoceptors. We're going to break these mechanoceptors into two main groups. They can be referred to as slow adapting and fast adapting. The two that are slow adapting, the SA1 and SA2 are continuously reading the environment. This is as opposed to the fast adapting or the FA1, FA2. These respond to a stimulus and then shut off. Okay, so that means they have to constantly be stimulated in order for them to create a response to your nervous system. So those are two main groups. We use slow adapting when we are standing in one place. So like a quiet stance. Quiet stance is how you are going to be able to maintain your balance standing in one place. The SA1, SA2 are continuously reading the ground underneath your feet to get any sort of sensory stimulation. Now, as opposed to uh, you are walking, so you get a trigger into your nervous system because your foot hit the ground and then it shuts off. But guess what? You're taking another step several milliseconds later and you get another stimulus, okay? Another example of how we use the SA1 
and SA2, the slow adapting, is if you're holding something. So if you're holding your phone or a cup of coffee and you are talking, right? How is it that you are able to hold the phone or the coffee and you're talking and you're talking and you're totally like subconsciously not paying attention to what's happening here, but you don't drop it. That is because of continuous feedback through your mechanoceptors to know how hard to push onto the phone or to the cup of coffee and to get a sense of skin stretch so that you don't let it go. Something that happens as you lose um, the sensitivity of the hands, it's, it's unique to the hands because you hold things with your hands, is that people who start to get decreased mechanoception sensitivity will start to spontaneously drop something. And that's because of a damage to those, those mechanoceptors. Um, my father, who is a um, uh, woodworker, he fabricates things. So he's constantly for exactly about 40 plus years, he's been using sanders and saws and every tool that he uses essentially has a vibration element to it. Now, even though your mechanoceptors are sensitive to vibration, you can overload them and then start to get a a, instead of getting an activation of nerves, you start to get a denervation. It's like you're overly stimulating that they start to shut off. So he started to get some of this um, in the mechanoceptors of his hands because of the excess vibration from the tools. And then he would spontaneously drop things. Um, so it's just interesting um, how you can see these changes. People with stroke will just spontaneously drop things and stuff like that. Let's get into them specifically and then we proceed. Your SA1, your SA1 slow adapting Merkel disc is sensitive to two point discrimination or what some people will, will refer to as texture. Now texture, we of course, with two-point discrimination, this is what we stimulate with Navoso. When you use Braille and you're reading Braille, that is two-point discrimination. That is a Merkel disc stimulus. Again, people will use this as texture, but it's actually not texture. Um, and I know we call our insoles texture is just a lay term to get people to start to understand it. But to everyone who's tuning in here, higher level. It's actually not texture. I want you to truly understand that it's two point discrimination. So if you're trying to stimulate uh, some sort of stimulus through the hands and feet SA1 is it has to be a two point discrimination tech, uh, texture, I almost just said it, two point discrimination pattern that is then stimulating the nervous system. Okay, I, ho I hope that helps. Um, just because some people may say, ah, oh, astroturf is a texture or rough carpet is a texture. Yes, but is that really stimulating SA1? Not really. Okay, SA2, Raffini ending, skin stretch. The skin stretch or the Raffini ending, what is powerful about this one is that it will actually down regulate the sympathetic nervous system to get you into a parasympathetic state, which is great. Um, it, this can be evident through doing uh, reflexology in the feet is a way that you can actually stimulate SA2. And there's a lot of research showing that reflexology feet down regulates the autonomic nervous system. So that's a fun one. Now, FA1, FA2, both of these are sensitive to vibration. Both of these are sensitive to vibration. FA1 is low frequency. FA2 is high frequency. Okay, here we go. Moving on to the internal side, interoception. This is your internal sensory perception and experiences. Now, interoception, again, this is the, the continuous assessment and uh, interpretation of your internal equilibrium, which we will see on the next slide is going to be referred to as homeostasis. Okay, so we all have our own baseline of what that equilibrium or that homeostatic balance is. What is for me is different than for my husband, is different for uh, my mom for, you know, my cousin, something like that. And the way that interoception works is that it's going to be powerfully linked to emotions. Um, and this is something that's very unique to us, uh, homo sapiens, is that we get a sensation. Let's call it butterflies in the stomach. You get butterflies in your stomach. And I have butterflies because I am about to give a presentation in front of 500 people. And I'm totally scared of public speaking. 
So I'm starting to get the butterflies. And then, so I, I feel that my interpretation of that sensation going into that experience is going to be fear-based. So I tack on an emotion to it. Let's say that this is different than um, my good friend, Roberto, who I know is tuning in. And he feels the butterflies and he associates that with um, it, it fires him up. Like he loves public speaking. So it just fires him up. He sees that as just like the motivation and energy and excitement. Two different, same sensation, two different interpretations of that. Now, what gave myself a interpretation was my own experiences. And what gave um, Roberto his is that it was his own experiences. Maybe mine was the last time I did it. I totally like blanked out. Maybe I even um, just was staring and I completely messed up. So now I'm kind of embarrassed about, you know, messing up, right? So just everyone's own interpretation. And what I often say is that when you're dealing with another individual, you don't know what established their interpretation and their equilibrium and the lens through which they look at things. So I try to be very understanding with my patients. Um, I try to be very patient and I try to understand some of that perspective of where they are coming from so that I can have compassion when I'm speaking to them. Uh, now, what this is referred to as far as the internal balance and equilibrium is going to be that homeostatic baseline. Anytime you shift away from that equilibrium, it's a shift in your homeostasis or this stability of your internal environment. Now, homeostasis can be physiological, which means that there's, there's shifts within body temperature, right? So we wanna stay around um, a, a baseline equilibrium in body temperature, but let's say that I'm in the infrared sauna, so I'm starting to feel my temperature rise. There's a homeostatic, actually it's an allostatic response to the shift in homeostasis to uh, trigger sweating. And then that's gonna help me regulate my body temperature, which it, there's an allostatic response to help you maintain a homeostasis. But this could also be happening from a psychological perspective. So if I have, um, you know, a shift that is within my emotional or psychological homeostasis, I may have a response. The allostatic response may be to um, mobilize. So if I have, I'm claustrophobic and uh, I'm in a situation where I'm, I'm in, let's say a tight elevator or something, and then I'm starting to get the sensation of being claustrophobic. So now I'm sorry, I feel myself sweating, right? So I'm, I'm sweating. So that's the sensation. Now I put an interpretation on that. And then I start to feel like every pore and I'm flushing. Okay. So I'm sensing these things and then I'm putting a response. I feel my heart rate starting to go up. So now I put an emotion to that response. And I literally from all these signs think that I'm going to die. So my response, my allostatic response is to mobilize and I get out of the elevator right? As soon as I'm out of the elevator, whew, everything back down, cool as a cucumber, right? Threat was diverted. So both of these can happen from internally, but also emotionally. Let's apply that or think about how you could apply that to our aging client where we're trying to reduce falls or literally every application. It's not just to aging uh, individuals. So here we go. How can we shift Oh, sorry, how can a shift in internal balance emotions impact external balance or fall risk? Okay, can your emotions actually directly influence your fall risk? That is interesting, right? Is my emotional state something that could be modified in a fall reduction program and be effective? Emotions is essentially an interpretation of this interoception. And a lot of interoception and our ability to perceive interoceptors is based around the autonomic nervous system, which is our fight or flight restoration disassociative balance, right? That's happening subconsciously and is what we can connect to the vagus nerve and vagal tone and heart rate variability. All of these things have to do with interoception, interoceptors, internal balance, equilibrium, and your emotional regulation or interpretation 
all of that has an effect on fall risk. And that's what I am trying to get um, professionals such as you to start to incorporate this in our fall reduction programming or um, for all of our clients. So let's take a look at emotions and breathing. So this is one way that we could say, and people are like, you're crazy. You can't connect emotions to fall risk, but let's do it based off of how we stabilize, how we stabilize our center of gravity. So for this, I'm gonna speak about breathing, okay? Does your emotional state change the way that you're breathing? Absolutely. When you are anxious, when you are in a fight or flight response, the way that you are going to be breathing is very different than if you're calm, you're in a safe place, right? This is where we start looking at our diaphragm and breathing patterns and the influence of breathing patterns on diaphragm stability. And then your diaphragm, since it is interconnected, myofascially interconnected with the deep core and the pelvic floor, any influence of the diaphragm is going to have an influence on the deep core stabilizers. So the way that we want to think of this is if I can alter the breathing pattern, where breathing patterns is a reflection of emotion, then that's going to affect the diaphragm, which influences the deep core and the pelvic floor. Yes, 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 we can. Okay. So supra diaphragmatic, you're breathing above. This is the shallow breathing, right? Chest breathing. This is going to be what's referred to as uh, a fight or flight, a sympathetic breathing response. It's accessory muscles. It's inefficient. It's not stable. And it's what I often refer to as allodynia breathing. So when you're really worked up, things become more painful than they would be if you were breathing in our other breathing pattern, which is subdiaphragmatic. Now, subdiaphragmatic, obviously belly breathing below the diaphragm. When you breathe below the diaphragm, this is going to be parasympathetic. This is safe. This is stable. This is your restoration breathing. And this is what is referred to as analgesic breathing. So you have the contrast and comparison, okay? And breathing patterns are oftentimes subconscious. So remember, this is where we're trying to make an impact on uh, patterns in our clients that are happening subconsciously, okay? So if we are in a worked up state because of a heightened sympathetic fear response, the pattern that that client can start to pick up is going to be supradiaphragmatic. This is obviously where we want to shift them away from this towards the subdiaphragmatic pattern. Now, the perception of threat, perception, can drive your client into a supra-diaphragmatic breathing pattern and start to destabilize the diaphragm to pelvic floor connection. I want to emphasize here, and if you're taking notes, I would underline or circle the perception because the perception could be a real threat or a perceived threat. Are we putting ourselves in a fight or flight state because we are constantly on guard and seeing threats where there really shouldn't be threats? It is definitely easy to start to see threat when you get kind of worked up and in that state. Um, again, that could be from the aging client who had a fall. Um, and I often give, give the example or the further explanation of if you had a client who had a fall and they, they fell, but they had the strength and the ability to get themselves up right away is very different than dealing with a client who fell and could not have, doesn't have the strength or didn't have the awareness to get themselves back up. And they were on the floor for a long time. Time, that starts to trigger other levels of the threat response in the nervous system if you feel like you are going to be on the floor and, and no one is going to find you. What if no one finds you, right? You start to kind of get into different perceptions. Um, I did a webinar on uh, stress, biopsychosocial. It's on the EBFA um, teachable platform. And on that, I go into the autonomic nervous system, the polyvagal theory, and how we essentially interpret threat based off of classification of, of that perception. Okay, so that would be the first way that I would be looking at how emotions can start to influence fall risk and stability is via this diaphragm pelvic floor connection. Yeah, okay. Next way that I want to tie in emotions impact on fall risk is through the memory impact. 
And when we start to lose memory or have memory compromise, and we're thinking of dynamic movement, well, now we start to have difficulty doing what's called dual tasking. Dual tasking is your ability to do a subconscious stabilization pattern, walking, and then do decision making at the same time. Something that we often take for granted, but let's say that you are walking, and as you're walking, the dual task is the decision that needs to be made. So you're, someone's coming to you and you, the individual, have to make a decision to go around them one way or the other way. Um, let's say you're walking and you're trying to cross the street. You have to make a decision, right? And there's cars going. You have to make a decision to time yourself of the car and do I go, right? That's a high level dual task. Um, yes, it is. Um, not so much multitask, but um, a great example of where people will see a compromise in dual tasking is, let's say if you are on a bus and you're holding on the rail of the bus and you're talking to someone. And then you notice that every time that the bus makes a corner or is kind of doing something unstable, right? So you have to kind of balance yourself, right? Correct yourself, you stop talking. Right? So you're talking, talking, and then there's, there's something that drives the priority of stabilization within your central nervous system higher, and you essentially stop the dual task of the conversation, and you prioritize your ability to stabilize, so you stop talking, and then when you're stable again, you resume the conversation. That's an example of a dual task, okay? And if you notice that a lot in someone, that is um, essentially them showing that that is a compromise in their dual task. Okay. All right. So older adults with cognitive problems have a higher fall risk. Okay. There is uh, an annual incidence of around 60 to 80% or twice that of cognitively normal older adults. So there is an association between fall risk and cognitive decline. Where I am looking at that association is going to be through the ability to dual task. Okay. That's where the memory is going to come in. Of course, there is a paralleled um, decrease in sensory perception or mind-body awareness with the cognitive decline. So you'll actually start to see a decreased sense of I am, and then you'll see a decrease in cognitive decline. So that's where you could actually start to uh, potentially screen or intervene with your clients is to maintain the I am mind-body connection as a way to protect cognitive function with age. That's totally what I would do and that's what I obviously am advocating here. <laughs> so this is really linking to body awareness. Okay, so that's the way that I would connect emotions, stability, emotions, dual task. Now obviously the whole point is going to be around how you can better manage your emotions as a way to protect the diaphragm function and the breathing pattern and as a way to protect the ability to dual task. That's what we want to do as well. Okay. So we are going to be bringing emotions and interoception to fall reduction programming to get better results with our clients. So now in order to do that, I want to take just a hair little bit deeper dive into where we find interoceptors and this concept of interoception, and then we'll tie it together, okay? And then start thinking of any questions that you might have. So interoceptors where we find this, where do we find them? Obviously, anyone who's familiar with interoception and kind of like visceral gut intuition, that is often associated with interoception, so it's gonna be gut, but more so than just your gut, which would be um, referred to as a visceroceptor. A visceroceptor is different than an interoceptor. Visceroceptor is a type of interoceptor. Oh my gosh, we have so many receptors. All right. Fascia. Fascia is where you will find your interoceptors, your entire myofascial web. So I like to think of your fascia as the organ of consciousness. Organ of consciousness. And I totally did not make that up. I got that from uh, a publication. I totally wish I did make that up. Fascia, the organ of consciousness. That means that there's this deep connection to I am that is associated with your myofascial web. So if you are currently looking at fascia as something that you foam roll or 
fascia as mechanical connective tissue that gives you the elastic energy to walk, run, and jump efficiently, and that's how you're looking at it, and you're not looking at it also from this emotional interoceptive I am side, then we want to bring that over here, right? Because it's a very powerful aspect. So let's take a look at why your fascia is so important from an emotional sense of I am. 80% of the nerves in your fascia are considered free nerves. Now I want to precede this by actually saying that we have 100 million sensory nerves in your fascia, 100 million sensory nerves. 80% of those nerves in your fascia are referred to as free nerves. It's just a classification of a nerve. Proprioceptors and mechanoceptors are technically myelinated. They're mechanical nerves. Free nerves are nociceptors, thermoceptors, interoceptors are just a different type of nerve. So this is essentially saying that 80% of 100 million nerves, so majority of them, are free nerves, which means they're either thermoceptors, nociceptors, or interoceptors. 90% of those are interoceptors. So a large majority of the 100 million nerves in your fascia have an interoceptive role. Interoception is the connection of mind, body, emotional interpretation. So we actually have a ratio of one to seven of mechanical proprioceptors to emotional interoceptors within our fascia, which means your fascia is really profoundly connected to this I am, this sense of self and the emotion that is tied to that. If you've ever heard the term motion is emotion and emotion connects motion, right, um, it's true. The way that you can think of this is that movement of your body, you can't move your body without really moving fascia because it's so deeply interconnected. And then every time you move your body, you are influencing your fascia, which means you have the ability to influence your emotion. That's really what we're saying here. So get everyone moving. All right, so bridging external sensory input with internal sensory input is necessary to optimize this I am or your body perception. How do we do that in our clients? Where do we start? So we're going to do what's called body-oriented therapy. This is actually a psychotherapy method and is your way to connect to your body perception internally and externally. We are going to start externally and that external awareness, why we want to start externally is because if you have someone who has lost their sense of self, they have decreased body awareness both internally and externally in space. It is safer, safer, emotionally safer for you to start externally, right? If, if you say, okay, I'm going to have you connect to your body and I want you to holds a weight or do like a bicep curl, something isometric, and they do it and just say like, I want you to feel the muscle contraction. I'm giving them a cue to connect to their body, but in a more external space, right? Versus if you're trying to take someone to something that is emotionally vulnerable, that's going to put the threat responses on much faster. So we're going to start externally. Okay. Um, oftentimes it's easier as well. So we're going to look at external sensations from touch, tension, and gravity. Touch, touch, tension, gravity is how we're going to bring this in. So we want to get our clients barefoot, right? Getting them out of their shoes, getting them on different surfaces. Of course, the Nobosa mat with our two-point discrimination. But what about being on uh, walking across a pebble path, right? They feel, feel each stone as you're walking across the pebble path. Um, feel the pressure of the stone. Feel the smoothness of the stone. Um, you know, walking on or being on a power plate, which is a whole body vibration platform, and then feel the vibration. So even though they're doing something externally, you're giving them a cue, which is actually connecting them to their body. Um, if we just have them do a balance exercise barefoot on the Naboso mat and don't cue them anything internally, you're not getting that added benefit of that body awareness, body perception. So you want to be very specific with your words so that we are getting um, the greatest response from them. OK, 
Okay, feel the vibration, feel the texture, feel the pressure. Okay. Now, second way that I like to do it is to use muscle contractions, like I said with the bicep curl. Now you could do this either through actually lifting weights and holding an isometric. It's going to be easier for people to feel the muscles, feel the muscles when they're doing an isometric exercise. Um, but you could do it if you said, I want you to, you know, contract your quads and then relax your quads, um, you know, contract your traps and then relax your traps. Those are different techniques that are often used in meditation as well. And um, ways to get the individual to connect to their body through muscle contractions and relaxation of the muscles. I like to use uh, weights because it helps people um, to find that resistance, okay? And then similar to this, similar to the weights, which I had alluded to earlier with gravity, is if you're trying to increase the sense of self and body awareness in space is using things that increase gravity. So a weighted vest. If you use a weighted vest on the client, they're going to have an increased perception of self um, using compression, using compression apparel is a really good way to increase the sense of self, whether it's the stockings and there's so many uh, compression apparel now that, you know, there's actually not high efficacy of um, compression apparel from uh, let's say maybe certain recovery, depending on the part of the body it is. But what I would say is if you use compression apparel or sleeves, like an arm sleeve or a, a calf sleeve, is it does increase that sense of self. Um, so, so play with that a little bit. Um, there's uh, wrist weights. Bala bangles is one that it looks like a bracelet versus an actual weight. So I will actually tell patients to use the, the wrist weight, the bala, bala bangle, and they could wear it and it looks like jewelry, but it's going to actually help them with the accuracy of their arm movements when they're grocery shopping and things like that. Um, and then of course, this is where kinesiology tape or rock tape could come in is that you're stimulating the subcutaneous fascia, which is building proprioception. So that can be used. If you put one across the thoracolumbar fascia, now that gives them awareness of how they're standing, that improves I am, that sense, uh, external sense. And then another way, or the last way that I like to incorporate it is through water work. Um, and I know that water is actually uh, taken away gravity and impact, but it's stimulating the skin. So similar to the compression apparel, you're getting just the, the stimulation of all of the skin that it helps to build an awareness of where their body is in space. Um, water and pool work is used a lot in um, babies that have brain injuries and are trying to first get that stimulation that sometimes uh, kids freak out when they can't sense where their self is in space, which is why uh, weighted blankets are really popular. Um, so the, the weight of a blanket or wrapping yourself, um, if you ever look at uh, sensory kids uh, catalogs and, and products, a lot of them are either they kind of like wrap them in things and it gives them a sense of themselves so that they can actually calm their nervous system. That's probably one of the, um, easiest ways to create the association is look at and study yourself the sensory spectrum that is seen in children and when there is children who are particularly sensory seeking they are sensory seeking to calm the nervous system because they get a sense of their self in space that i am which allows them to feel safe and then they become emotionally regulated that's really what we're trying to do and apply it here Okay, your next side, then flip it over here, is going to be reconnecting to your internal side, your interoceptors, the mind body. So this could be you doing breath work with them. If you're already doing breath work, that's bringing them into their interoception, doing a walking meditation, concentration. So this is where if you're having them uh, stand on the Naboso mat and you say, I want you to feel the texture under your feet. They could even shut their eyes, right? And feel the texture under your feet. You are essentially starting to bridge intero and exteroception because of that concentration element. You're bringing that mind-body connection. So you might already be doing it, right? Feeling the body, feel the tension, feel the traps, contract the muscle, relax the muscle. All of that is going to help build that awareness for that individual. 
Last concept that I want to go over, and then I'm going to take any questions that you guys might have as we go into our last uh, kind of home stretch here, is going to be how you can assess interoceptive awareness in your clients. And this is based off of what's called heartbeat tracking. So heartbeat tracking and the perception of your heartbeat is a great way to assess, but also build interoceptive awareness in your clients. The way that this is done when you're assessing is that you would be either seated in a, in a position with your feet flat on the floor and your palms are up, your eyes are shut, and you are sensing your heartbeat. And then you would compare it to your actual heartbeat. Or you could be lying on your back in a savasana with your palms facing up and your eyes shut. And then you start to sense your heartbeat. And then you... Uh, same thing, you count it and then you compare it to your actual pulse. Okay, so that's how you would assess. Um, great. Okay, we're going to do it. Okay, because we have seven minutes left. Okay. So here we go. Um, what I'm going to have everyone do is that if you could either get into a position that uh, you feel comfortable, either seated in a chair with your feet flat and your palms facing up, or you're going to be on your back with your eyes shut and your palms facing up. I'm going to have you count your heartbeat. So you're going to shut your eyes and sense the heartbeat. And then when you get the sense of it, I will tell you when to start and you're going to count your heartbeat for 15 seconds. And then you're going to stay exactly as you are and you're going to move your one hand over to the other wrist see, to the other wrist where you have your radial pulse and count your actual heart rate and then you're going to compare them okay 15 seconds just perceiving 15 seconds actually feeling your pulse here we go okay so assume your position seated lying down i'm going to be quiet for a moment so you can focus and find your your heartbeat And then when you have that pattern, we're going to start in just a second. And start. And stop. So now you're going to go over to your radial pulse. Stay exactly as you are every other way. Just go over to your wrist. Find your actual pulse. Again, I'll be quiet for a second. Find the pattern. And then start. Great. Okay. So I'm going to have you sit up or open your eyes. And now what you're going to do is you are going to compare what you perceived to what your actual pulse was. So let's say when my eyes were shut and I was counting for 15 seconds, I sensed 13 beats, let's say. And then my actual heart rate was 15 right? So 13 divided by 15, call that, I don't know, 90% accuracy, right? So just find what your accuracy is. Now, when you look at the research of interoceptive awareness and heartbeat tracking, is if you have an accuracy of 80% or higher, you are what is perceived or called high interoceptive awareness, versus if you have a accuracy of 60% or less, you would have a low interoceptive awareness. The higher your interoceptive awareness, the more you are sensing your internal environment, this could be positive or negative, the more you uh, sense your internal environment, and you can hopefully start to sense the shifts in your internal equilibrium, which then is going to start to affect the emotion and you can consciously override it because you have a high interoceptive awareness. This would be, let's say, if you're someone who you start to sense that you're getting worked up, you have high interoceptive awareness and you can feel that you're starting to get worked up, right? 
you're, there's traffic, there's traffic and you know that you can't do anything about the traffic, but you're starting to sweat again. <laughs> Everything's about sweating because it's really hot. So I'm sweating right now, <laughs> right? So it's, uh, you're starting to sweat. So you feel yourself starting to get worked up. You start to feel that you're getting right little palpitations, right? And you know that if you let it get out of control, you're just going to snap and you're going to like start honking or you sense the shift. You interject the shift through conscious self-awareness and you say, relax, Emily. It's okay. They will wait for you. You will be fine. The traffic will move, right? So that's you emotionally regulating. That's the goal of interoceptive awareness or having high interoceptive awareness. Someone who would have lower interoceptive awareness doesn't feel that their emotions or their homeostasis is shifting until they're already flipped over into a super pissed off state and then they just react, right? Those are people that need to slow things down, try to interject and regulate that emotion. That is built around interoception, okay? And that is how we want to start applying this to our clients and maybe we have to start building external cues to maintain that sense of self. If I'm starting to get worked up, maybe you teach me that you say, just feel the ground under you, right? Just feel the ground. Some people will actually like stomp their feet, right? Right? Or I need you to do this, right? There's so many EMDR and so many different techniques that anything that's tapping, right? Really what I'm doing is I'm sensing myself, right? I feel myself, all of these different therapy techniques. Okay, so I feel my hands, I push my hands, so I make a fist, right? Contract and then relax, feel the ground under your feet. Okay, that's how we wanna start integrating this. Beautiful, here we go. Okay, so there's some recommended reads. And then if you guys have questions, please type those in and we'll make sure we go through those. We are chugging just along. I'm going to do five minutes of questions. So I'm gonna to try to be very efficient through this out of respect of everyone's time. These recommended reads are great to start building an understanding of interoception, mind-body connections, and then of course, sensory stimulation as well. If you want this PowerPoint, please email me. Please email me, education at ebfafitness.com. Education at ebfafitness.com and I will send you this PowerPoint so that you can hear it. Everyone is getting a link to the recording as well, but just in case you happen to be listening on a different platform, that would be the email. If you like this lecture and you want to go down the rabbit hole even more, please check out our latest certification through EBFA, which is our interoception performance specialist. It's essentially what I went over today, but much deeper um, so that you can apply this to both performance, athletes, all clients, or of course, fall reduction. If you use code webinar, you will get 15% off and that is through the end of the month. So 15% off that newest certification. There is an exam, there's ACE and NASM CECs. And then for Naboso, who is one of the sponsors for this, or the sponsor for this, you get 15% off site wide with code webinar. So webinar will get you 15% off site wide on our two point discrimination insoles and mats. And that is through the end of the month. Head to naboso.com. I'm going to take any questions that you guys have as you type those in. And then if for some reason anyone has to go, you will be getting the recording. And then if you are tuning in from again, different platforms such as Facebook, then please email me education at ebfafitness.com. Here we go with some of our questions. Uh, so there was a question about, um, Michael asked a question, what about the mobile board? Which for those who are not familiar with the mobile board, it essentially has a cut out for the digits. So it's, it's a wobble board with the big toe down and then the other digits are loose. And then it's just trying to reinforce the connection with the hallux or the flexor hallucis longus. Um, is that considered proprioceptive tool? Absolutely. That's not mechanoceptive. Now, if the mobile board had the Naboso material on top of it, then you would say I'm combining mechanoception through two point discrimination and proprioception through the instability of the uh, wobble board aspect of it. Okay, great question. Uh, ben said repetition is key to mastery, which I am guessing is off of some of the repeat 
points, but yes, it is. Um, can you do short foot for body awareness? Yes. So that would be the muscle contraction, right? So pushing your toes down, engaging your pelvic floor, feel yourself, feel that connection, exhale as you're doing it. It's a fascial tension based cue, which is yes, fascial is proprioceptive as well as emotional. So yes, you absolutely can. Um, Excellent. Uh, so Bill asked a question as far as which books do I recommend? That is listed here. I'm going to go back on the slide so that you guys can see if you want to take a screenshot or take your phone and take a picture of it. There's, of course, many more books that I recommend, but these are some of my top ones. Great. Um, so a client says that her feet are always cold. They want to wear socks on the Nabosa mat. Do you let them? Here's something really interesting that I would recommend for everyone is that the more that you get plantar foot stimulation, whether it's barefoot, it's minimal shoes, it's on the Naboso insoles or mats, the more that you get plantar foot cutaneous means skin, right? These micro nerves in the feet, the more you get them stimulated and the circulation in your feet because tiny uh, blood vessels supply nerves and vice versa, people will actually say their feet don't get as cold. Um, so that's where I would try to encourage them that the more that they actually kind of get out of the uh, sock environment, they will start to stimulate the natural heating mechanism of their body. That's how I would approach it. Um, can you try to do thinner socks and then start to break the time with the socks? Maybe, but ideally I like barefoot on them because you do get um, increased skin perfusion with sensory stimulation. Great, yes, I am going to put in my email here. That is a great, uh, uh, great tip. So education at ebfafitness.com. Okay. And then again, you have the websites with the discount. So that was great. Um, how would you use gravity or rock tape for a person with focal dystonia of the foot, foot, ankle, and hip? For example, quad and hamstrings not working and affected by dorsiflexion. Um, so again, what I would do is, so when it's more limb specific, so, um, Foot and ankle dystonia is a little bit hard because that you actually see a lot in runners and it could be uh, stress duration induced in a sense. Um, so I would maybe look at doing myofascial release, barefoot stimulation. Um, could you use rock tape and things like that on the lower extremity? Um, if they're having a lot of issues in that foot and ankle side, that's where you would look more at like ankle weights versus chest weights. So like a weighted vest. Um, so you may have to be more limb specific or joint specific for that client with that dystonia. Um, okay, great. Uh, Pat said, fascinating topic. Thank you. Nervous, really helpful. Understanding. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The person is a runner. Yeah. So um, Roberta's question as far as foot dystonia is very common in runners. Um, so what I would do is make sure you're balancing the recovery of the muscles. You don't want to overstimulate the, the nervous system. You want to make sure that they find this balance of stimulus recovery, balanced muscle contractions with someone who's going into that dystonia response. Um, and if you have more questions on that, Roberta, you can absolutely message me and, and uh, we can go deep dive into it offline. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Again, real quick, if you do want the recording, email me education at EBFA Fitness. That was typed in. And then stay tuned for more additional free and online courses and webinars from EBFA. Thank you guys all so very much. Have an amazing night.